नमस्कार सुस्वागत केमचो आदाबार्स वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून आप सभी का पी आर एल कैमरे व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है ए वेरी वॉम वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर द पी आर एल का अमृत व्याख्यान टुडे इज द सिक्सटी नाइन्थ एपिसोड ऑफ सीरीज ऑफ व्याख्यान ऑफ सेवेंटी फाइव which is being organized by prl as a part of prl 75 years of legacy and history in fundamental physics and space sciences established in the year 1947 by the father of indian space program dr vikram sarabhai the prl pratem jubilee coincides with, with india's 75 years of independence hence it's a joint celebration of the development of science and technology in india by prl under the banner of prl kamrit factory today we have yet another very distinguished vikhan karta with us dr shekhar mande who is currently distinguished professor of uh, bioinformatics center at savitra bhai phule pune university and uh, also honorary distinguished scientist of uh, national center for cell science in pune but he is much more known as the former director general of csir and secretary dsir and he is going to talk to us on addressing indian societal problems through science technology and innovation in post independent india we really thank and appreciate dr mande for agreeing and accepting our invitation to be with us at today's vyakhyan which is a part of prl's pratyam jubilee celebration and ajadi kamrit mahotsav i now request my colleague uh, professor desh pande to kindly introduce dr shekhar mande to our webex panel as well as those who have joined us live on the prl youtube channel over to you dr desh pande thank you very much professor badwaj good afternoon everyone uh, as such uh, dr mande is such a well known figure that it doesn't require uh, you know any kind of introduction but for the sake of completeness i would like to introduce and also i cannot resist introducing him so let me take a few minutes to briefly introduce him uh, dr shekhar mande is a structural biologist and an x-ray crystallographer of international repute he is well known worldwide for his research on the structural characterization of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis proteins and the computational analysis of genome wide protein interaction Dr Mande holds a PhD in molecular biophysics from the Indian Institute of Sciences in Bangalore and just now he was mentioning that he was selected here in PRL and then uh, at the same time he got selected there and that, that's where he continued later on as a postdoc he worked with professor Vim G Hall for his postdoctoral research at University of Groningen Netherlands and then as a senior fellow at the University of Washington Seattle USC uh, in 1990 five he returned to india and after returning to india he served uh, at institute of micro microbial technology chandigarh center for dna fingerprinting and diagnostics hyderabad and the national center for cell sciences pune where he rose to the post of director of the institute from 2018 to 22 dr mande was the dg of csir and the secretary of the dsir ministry of science and technology and currently dr mande is a distinguished professor at bioinformatics center of savitri bai phule pune university at pune and also an honorary distinguished scientist at national center for cell sciences pune he is a fellow of all the three national academies of sciences in india he is the recipient of the prestigious shanti swarup bhatnagar prize for science and technology he was awarded welcome trust international senior fellowship and in addition to these achievements he is highly acclaimed scientist science educator and science administrator with several national and international awards and honors to his credit which are too numerous to name individually at this point so without uh, taking any more time in in his introduction i now request dr mande on behalf of all of us here on webex platform and on behalf of all of us who are viewing on youtube to deliver his talk dr mande welcome to prl for this talk thank you dr deshpande 
uh, for the very kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Bharadwaj, uh, for arranging all of these. Uh, it's a privilege and pleasure for me to be present amongst all of you. As Dr. Deshpande was just mentioning, I did indeed uh, have a choice of coming to PRL in 1984 uh, for my PhD. But it so happened then that uh, I had just heard a lecture by Professor G.M. Anandachandran on molecular biophysics. And his lecture was so overwhelming that I couldn't have avoided the temptation of joining molecular biophysics unit in Institute of Science Bangalore for my PhD. Uh, as luck would have it, I ended up there. I would have been one amongst you today in this particular panel. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it was a privilege for me to be here today. And when I was approached for this particular talk, uh, I thought I will talk about something of speed instead of talking about my work or something. I'll talk about a bit of India's science and technology history, the contemporary history, and especially we talking since 1947, how it has happened. Most of us, when we read India's recent history post 1947, we spent a lot of time on the establishment of organizations such as ISRO, such as DAE, and all those. But I thought I will highlight a few societal problems that we faced during the years and how we solved these problems by application of science and technology. That's the objective of my talk uh, here. And uh, before we go further, we will start from 1947. Uh, that uh, how the situation was there in 1947. And let us remind ourselves uh, that we had been coming out of 190 years of colonial rule in 1947. Our population was 340 million. The literacy was about 12%. Now compare that today, our population is about 1.4 billion and our literacy rate is close to 75%, all right? So that's what we have traveled in 75 years. Our contribution to global GDP had dropped from 23% in the year 1800 or 27% in year 1700 to about 2% in 1947. Now compare this number with some of the most advanced economies of today, especially let us say US. So USA's contribution to world GDP today is of the order of about 18 or 20 percent. India's contribution in the year 1800 was 23 percent. So you can imagine how we were. Our GDP was 2.7 lakh crore rupees. Today it is of the same order, about 3 lakh crore per dollars, US dollars. We are just coming out of uh, the Bengal famine, uh, 1943 famine. About 30 lakh people had died of the famine because they did not get food to eat. This kind of situation is unimaginable today. In fact, the history of famines tell us that since 1760 onwards, roughly 1757 was the Battle of Plassey, that uh, the East India Company fought for the first time on our soil. Since then, every 25 years till 1943, there has been a major famine in the country. And in each famine, we have lost lakhs of people. But the last of which was 1943. 1947 also witnessed one of the largest human migrations in the history of mankind for some very artificial and very stupid reasons. But nonetheless, these migrations did indeed take place. We had very little industrial development and we had less than 20 universities. So against this background, we are going to come today now to about 75% literacy rate and about 3 lakh uh, crore dollars of GDP. All right. And what I would like to do is also the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are defined such as this, the 17 SDGs as United Nations develops. And they have been de defined very recently, but nonetheless, it would be good to look at our development in the context of how United Nations develop, uh, sustainable development goals have been and how we have done against each of the goals since 1947. So let us start, right? I mean, we can start from the era of institution building, and that's the, the sustainable development goal number four that is uh, providing quality infrastructure, quality education infrastructure. And as I said, that we had only about uh, 
of uh, 20 universities in 1947. The University Grants Commission itself came into being in 1953. The IITs began their journey. The first of the IITs in Kharagpur was founded in 1950. From today, we have close to about 1,000 universities and higher education institutions in the country. As far as the publicly funded organizations, the first of the publicly funded organizations was CSIR through public money, and it was in 1942. And after that, post independence, we started with a whole lot of them ICAR, Department of Atomic Energy, ICMR, DRDO, and so on and so forth. So let us look at a brief history of 1947, how it was. And CSIR being one of the first publicly funded organizations, it was founded as the Board of Scientific and Industry Research in 1940 which converted itself into Industrial Research Utilization Committee in 1941. And then CSR itself was born under Society's Registration Act in 1942. So 26 September 1942 is primarily because of the efforts of people like the photograph that you see is that of Sir Arkad Ramaswamy Mudia. People like this actually lobbied with the government to start a publicly funded organization in the country. But in 1947, let us look at what we were doing at the time of independence. On 26 August 1947, nearly 11 days after independence, we were holding the first governing body meeting of CSIR. Imagine going through the trauma of partition, going through the trauma of coming out of famine. Immense problem that we are actually confronting us, how we are going to implement democracy how we are going to generate jobs, how we are actually going to become a prosperous nation, how we are going to provide food to eat to people. 11 days after independence, there was a support to science and technology in the form of the governing body, which was the vice president of the governing body was none other than Shama Prasad Mukherjee, the legendary son of Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee. And the members included in the governing body and look at a panel, Dr. Abdul Khwaja Hamid, the person who had founded SIPLA about 20 years before. J.R.D. Tata, B.C. Roy, Dr. K.S. Krishnan, and so on and so forth. And among the scientists, also you see Baba, Raman, Birbal Sahani, Vadia. So that was the strength of our science and technology thinking that everyone who mattered in the society, whether be it policy makers, whether be it industrialists, or whether we scientists, we are going to generate a strong incentive ecosystem in the country. And we adopted, therefore, science, technology, and innovation as one of the major drivers of our society. This was a phenomenal decision, absolutely phenomenal. And we began, as I showed you in the previous slide in the right earnest, in founding organizations first, and then slowly taking the problems one after another. One by one. And let me actually highlight some problems of how we actually solve those problems. One of the first things that happened was in 1945, Dr. Bhabha was very keen on starting an institute which could do fundamental research in the country. And then a tripartite agreement was signed between the government of Bombay then by the Tata Trust and by government of India to start a Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. That was 1945. And CSIR provided initial support to TIFR to provide grants to TIFR from the beginning. But another activity had also started. There was a committee under Bhabha's leadership to explore India's atomic energy resources and suggest ways and develop how we can actually, we are going to uh, harness the uh, 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 India's atomic energy resources. And this committee eventually recommended, the committee had Bhabha, Krishnan, and Bhatnaga and uh, it recommended that India must have an Atomic Energy Commission. And with that, the Atomic Energy Commission in India came into being in 1948. And this was signed on behalf of the government of India by none other than Shanti Surupatnaga. As you can see here, on 10th August 1948, the government of India began, started the Atomic Energy Commission. And it actually also formed the Atomic Energy Act, which was replaced later in the 1970s. But the mandate was actually mentioned here in this particular 
uh, gazette notification. It's a fantastic step. That to start a program in atomic energy, what the world would have actually viewed with great suspicion. But the world also viewed India as a country that cannot be held together by democracy. Most of the Western countries believed that India probably cannot survive as one single country. It might fragment into multiple princely states, and moreover, implementation of democracy was going to be daunting in India. And that's all it was actually. But we did wonderful event in addressing every issue that confronted us from time to time. And what we have developed over the years is a fantastic system which have national laboratories here in between, whether they be of CSIR, ICMR, ICR, DST, DBT, and all. And they continuously work on societal and industrial problems and bring innovations on the way. On the other hand, we have a large number of IITs and universities with a focus scoped on generation of next generation human resources. And then we have strategic organizations, some fantastic strategic organizations such as DRDO, Space, Devota Atomic Energy, and so on and so forth. Together, that constitutes today's SNT ecosystem in the country, and it has contributed fantastically well in India's development in the last 75 years. As I said, implementation of democracy was the first immediate challenge that what we had. And 1951, where the democratic elections were going to be held. And the first problem that was posed to the people was, how do you ensure that people do not vote multiple times? Especially given zamindari kind of the system that was prevalent, how do you ensure that the zamindar does not go and vote for all the laborers on his or her farm? And for that, the problem was posed to the scientists. And the scientists came up gloriously with the solution they developed this ink. Our Indian scientists, our own scientists, they developed the ink in the National Physical Laboratory in Delhi. And the technology was transferred to Mysore Inks Private Limited. And since then, since 1951, in every election, this ink has been used. It's not rocket science, but nonetheless, it's a science which helped India implement all the democratic principles. It's a silver nitrate solution diluted silver nitrate solutions and cannot be washed off simply by soap or water or something like that. Amazing. So these are the problems, this kind of problems that were actually confronted in uh, Indian society. And that's how we were actually coming up with solutions. I want to give two or three other highlights of what kind of societal problems were there. So when we talk of sustainable development goals and when we talk of global hunger, the sustainable development goal number two, now, all of you are aware of this particular uh, development. There is a green revolution, but I want to give you a little bit background of green revolution and what went behind green revolution. 1965, India was looking at an imminent uh, famine. Number of years it had not rained, and there was an immediate danger that we will not be able to provide food to our population. It is at that time some countries came forward and they supplied food to us, and we are grateful to them that they did that. And some of you of my age here in this audience would recall a project called PL480. That's when we got some grains from the US. And the grains were brought in Delhi and stored in the godown, and then they were distributed. You'll be surprised to know what a godown is today. That a godown and a PL480 project is today what we call as the technology bhavan, or is the headquarter of the Department of Science and Technology. Nonetheless, in 1965, because of the imminent danger that we will not be able to supply food to our population, it was realized that Norman Berlock had already developed a dwarf variety of wheat. And possibly this dwarf variety of wheat, by the time that he actually uses less water and pesticides and all, could be brought to India. And none other than C. Subramaniam here, who was then the agriculture minister, immediately took steps and requested one of his secretaries, Shivram, to write a proposal so that normal borrow can be brought to India and we can explore implementation of better agriculture practices. And Professor Swaminathan, shown here, immediately agreed to implement these practices. By then, 
India had also developed well grounded irrigation system. So water could be provided. But what India had was mechanization of agriculture. And at that time, government of India suggested that instead of importing tractors, which we were doing from Bulgaria mostly at that time, and a foreign uh, reserve crisis was actually looming large, at that time, government of India decided that we must develop our own tractor. And it is at that time, government of India appealed to CSIR to develop. So Central Mechanical Engineering Research Institute then started developing a tractor. And the first tractor rolled out in 1970 is what's shown here, Swaraj. And this actually also led to the one of the first examples of a spin-off company from Indian Academic Organization. And the company was Punjab Tractors Limited. Even today, they manufacture tractors like Swaraj and Sonalika that you would have seen in the field. We also had to develop our own pesticides and laboratories such as National Chemical Laboratory in Pune. And what we call today as Indians of Chemical Technology in Hyderabad came forward in making pesticides in India. And all put together the better irrigation practices, cultivation of dwarf wheat, and other crops which can be cultivated easily in the geoclimatic regions, especially in the northern Indian, mechanization of agriculture, and making pesticides available. It was a comprehensive solution. It was not simply one thing that could have done without other. And that made green revolution possible. And today, India is surplus in all the grains. When other countries are looking for food, India can actually supply food to others. Fantastic. Many countries became independent around the same time as India did, plus minus 15 years. About 60 or 70 countries in Africa, Southeast Asia, and so on and so forth, they gained independence from the colonial powers around the same time. India stands out as one country in which we have made so much progress, especially in agriculture. It's just amazing. Another problem was looming large, and that problem related to India's health sector. We are losing lots of children below the age of five to malnutrition, and we are losing children because they were actually in very infant stage and not getting proper nutrition from their mother. So the government formed a committee under the chairmanship of somebody called Krishan Chand, who was the Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Commerce then, and the committee is what is called as the Milk Powder Committee. What we decided was, milk was being produced in the country in certain states, but they were unable to transport milk from one place to another because of the lack of cold storage facilities or some other things. So the solution that was suggested by international experts who served on the milk powder committee, they were experts from New Zealand, they were experts from Ireland, they were experts from Switzerland who came here. And they suggested that the only immediate way of transporting milk from one place to another was by converting the milk into milk powder. And that could actually reduce the infant deaths significantly if you're doing that. And that's the sustainable development goal number three of United Nations today. However, the committee recorded in its minutes, this report is very readable, those of you who are interested in history, recorded saying that Indian milk cannot be converted into milk powder because India uses principally buffalo milk, which is high in fat, Unlike other nations like New Zealand, Australia, uh, Switzerland, and other countries, they use principally cow milk, which is less in fat and can be converted easily into milk powder. Varghese Kurian had an immediate problem to solve then. What would he do? He flew down to Mysore to Central Food Technology Research Institute in Mysore. All right. And a person there was. Dr. Subramaniam, who was the director of CFTRI, and together they decided that even buffalo milk could be converted into milk powder. And they came up with a very simple scientific solution to the problem that because of high fat is there in the milk, if you centrifuge the milk at a very high speed, it is possible to remove fat from the milk. Fat essentially is non soluble, non water soluble in the matter, and therefore it can be actually removed by simply high speed, high speed centrifugation. And that's exactly what they did. 
and the milk then could be converted into milk powder. And gloriously, they did. How do you show that this milk powder is fit for consumption? Especially, how do you show that infants can be given this milk powder and we can reduce the death rate of infants then? Both Vargas Kurian and Subramanian flew down to Christian Medical College, they know, and conducted clinical trials on the milk powder. Can you imagine? Even then, they could conduct clinical trials, which was funded by CSIR at that particular point of time, and they made actually sure that the milk powder is fit for consumption. And many of you would have seen this particular tin when we were children. It used to carry a logo of CFTRI. But this milk tin, our mothers typically used to store grains in this, lentils. And when it actually gathered rust like this, the milk tin would be used for storing washing powder and things like that. All of you would remember, people of my age would remember that. And that's the power of recycle, reuse philosophy, even then, which was prevalent. Once again, just as much as the Green Revolution, we also were able to undertake milk revolution that transformed the country like never before. I want to tell you another example, and that's where science and technology played another very major important role. And I will actually a little bit elaborate on the leather industry of India as a representative example. India's leather industry at the time of independence employed less than 25,000 people. Indian exports to leather in leather sector were essentially raw hides and skins. We did not have ability to generate finished products out of leather. There was a committee which is formed here, that is Sitaramaya Committee in 1970. And the Sitaramaya Committee actually gave recommendations saying that all the raw hides and skins may now be banned and we must develop a leather industry within ourselves. Leather industry also requires very specialized chemicals to be made and those chemicals also was desired to be made in India, which we did. The Central Leather Research Institute, CLRI Chennai, did that gloriously. Developed not only the indigenous chemicals, but all the technologies related to leather products and making them mechanizing the leather industry. Today, let us look at the numbers. India's leather industry employs more than 45 lakh people. About 80% of these are women. From 25,000 people at the time of independence today, we have 45 lakh people who are employed by leather industry. More than 30 to 40% have been directly trained in Central Leather Research Institute. And how are we doing in exports? Today, India's leather, finished leather products is roughly of the order of $4.5 billion. Today, India and Indian foot leather products is we are the second largest export, exporter in leather garments, third largest exporter of sadly, and Haran is the fourth larger exporter of leather goods in the world. This accounts for about 7% of the total leather export in 2021-2022. This phenomenal. How we could actually do this? That in no time we are able to not only provide jobs to people, but develop an entire sector that could be so much valuable for India's economy. It's amazing. And if someone says that there is no science and technology behind that, I think that would be a very, very ridiculous suggestion of all the four examples that I have given to you. Whether the implementation of democracy, whether by unfolding the green revolution, or whether the milk revolution that took place, what we also call as the white revolution, and the leather industry. I have given you only four representative examples how India transformed itself from 1947. Today, what our GDP I told you, and today we are the third or the fourth largest economy in the world. It's phenomenal. We have been able to lift more than about 400 million people out of poverty in the last few years. 400 million people we have been able to lift out of poverty in the last 10 years. It's just amazing how we could do it. And that's because we adopted science, technology, and innovation as the principal driver of our economic growth. 
And we must continue on this path in which we continue doing science, technology, innovation as the path for our future. What it also gave us the 75 years was a tremendous confidence in ourselves. So when the COVID-19 struck us, got forbidden, had COVID-19 come about 50 years ago, I don't think we would have been able to handle the, the pandemic as well as what we did during the last three years. We could be doing own vaccines. The international companies were trying to arm twist us on the vaccines, but we said that we could make our own vaccines. But more than that, we also made several original contributions in the field of science and technology in terms of quantitative mitigation. For example, we were among the first countries to come up with building ventilation guidelines. And why was that? Because we realized, unlike the WHO and unlike the, unlike the CDC agenda, that the disease is spread principally through aerosols. Most of the world believed the disease spreads through contaminated surfaces by touch. But we, in 2020 itself, had started talking that a disease principally spreads through aerosols. An infected person exhales aerosols, or while speaking, emits aerosols, or while singing or talking loud. And aerosols have virus encapsulated in them, and these aerosols can remain uh, suspended in the air for a very long time. But there is a way of treating the aerosols. If one can treat the aerosols by which the virus can be inactivated, methods such as heat or simple exposure to UV light, they are 100 year old techniques. These techniques are not new. But if you can do this, the virus can be infected from the aerosols. And that's exactly what we did. We not only came up with building ventilation guidelines, we also came up with the UV inactivation of the virus. And we were able to install these solutions in places such as the Parliament of India, in railway coaches, and in AC buses. The Vande Bharat Express that have been rolled out these days that are in the news, all of them carry this UV solution, which is hidden in the compartment. You cannot see it, but the air before which is air before it is brought in into the compartment is treated with UV, so that any circulated air that goes in in the enclosed area is always treated before it comes into that enclosed area. And therefore the chance of having active virus or any active infection, which is bacterial mediated, can be avoided. This is fantastic. I think we should be very proud that we could do all of this in the COVID pandemic, not only vaccines, but many, many other things that we are able to do. And that gives us the confidence that today we are set in which we can address some of the most challenging issues that we have ever faced, not only for our country, but for entire humanity. I just want to actually highlight two of the issues that are confronting us today and how we could, by application of science and innovation, probably solve them. One of the issues relates to water. In India, we were water surplus country till about 1950, but very rapidly, we moved towards water stress country and we are moving very rapidly to water scarce country. And that is because of the indiscriminate use of water resources, both above and below the ground surface. Now this can lead to potentially very dangerous situation. And we must find solution to this ourselves. Only we and our scientists and technologists can find solution to conservation of water in a proper way. And one way in which we could actually do such a thing, solution is that to map subsurface groundwater, especially aquifers and other areas, and try to see how we can effectively recharge all of our subsurface groundwater resources. And one such technique is by mapping electromagnetic, by electromagnetic sensors the, below the surface groundwater, especially aquifers and all, and show that can be done. And this is an experiment that was done in uh, near Hyderabad in a village called Chotupal, in which it was shown that below the surface there is a large aquifer that existed. And therefore, if we created an artificial lake here, this water could seep into that and we could then uh, recharge the entire groundwater in that particular area. This area had turned almost into arid or semi-arid kind of region. 
And there's a lot of migration that was seen from the Chotukal village to the nearby cities, especially Vijayawada and Hyderabad. In five years, after having successfully shown this particular example, today, all the aquifers are really recharged and the groundwater has come down to roughly about five meters from the ground and people in the region have started cultivating paddy, one of the most water intensive crops. People have started cultivating that. So what I wanted to show you is that there's only one possible solution. There have been multiple solutions that can be done in looking at how we can conserve water. But nonetheless, by applications of science and technology, we can come up with the solutions of local problems. We don't really need Western help in coming here and telling us what should be done and what should not be done. We are capable on our own. It's a help, of course, is good for peer review and all, but nonetheless, our SNT community is perfectly capable on solving this. Another example that is now confronting humanity is our dependence on fossil fuels. How are we going to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels? At one way, potential way that people think it could be done is to use biofuels. We are not sure if the biofuels is the real answer for reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, but nonetheless, is one of the answers in which we could use the waste biomaterial, such as waste cooking oil or such as waste agri residues, and try to see whether we can generate biofuels out of this. And indeed, one of our laboratories, the Indians of Petroleum in Dehradun, actually showed they can they can make sustainable aviation fuel and they signed then MOU with multiple airlines including the Indigo and the SpiceJet and all and they were able to successfully demonstrate two flights one on the 26 January 2019 the Air Force flights and more recently the Indian Air Force flights that landed in Zay they were able to show that sustainable aviation fuel can be used in doing this these flights. So much so that Boeing has come to India now saying that they would be interested in learning how India makes sustainable aviation fuel. So that shows the promise of our science and technology community. A company like Boeing coming to India and saying that we would like to partner with you and try to make SAFs along with you. Now this actually represents the, the real spectrum of the changes in India's SNT community. This is not very far that our SNT and I community start exerting itself and its influence on the matters which relate to humanity. And as I said, the huge problem that confront humanity, the sustainable development, of course, is one such thing that we actually need to look at. And we must ensure that a climate change and other matters that we're actually looking at, looking at very, very uh, with great concern, we can start addressing those issues through our SNT and by province in our country. So what actually I wanted to tell you in the last uh, some time in the lecture is that we have always been a very affluent society till about 1800, until the arrival of colonial powers, and this affluence was driven strongly by strong science, technology, and innovation ecosystem that existed in the country. And although we miss the fruits of the first and the second, and possibly the third industrial revolution, the emphasis on science and technology and taking help of ST and I for developing our society has paid rich dividends. And as we continue our journey, our focus must be on the future of humanity and that of the planet. And one major learning from our culture, which many scientists might actually miss, is that, and I just want to quote it because I had a chance meeting with His Holiness Dalai Lama two years ago. And when he understood that I'm a scientist, he had a very nice long conversation with me. And what His Holiness Dalai Lama told me was that, in our culture, we have not compartmentalized science as that thing that tries to understand the material world. We always integrate human mind and spirit with the material world. And therefore, for the holistic development of humanity, we must 
integrate human spirit, human mind, along with uh, the material world. Unlike many other scientists that actually might visualize science today as that aspect of human learning, which addresses only the material world around us. And if we take that narrow position, that we just want to understand the world around us through gaining knowledge about it, I think that would be wrong. And therefore, we must learn to integrate ourselves with that particular knowledge. And I'm pretty sure if we take this learning forward, and if we start addressing the problems of humanity for the future, we will come up with as elegant solutions as what we have done in the past. Some of the examples that I showed, I don't have much time to talk about many, many other examples that we have actually seen during the period. But nonetheless, I thought I will tell you only three or four representative examples in this particular aspect. I do hope that the younger audience uh, who is here will feel bolstered by the new confidence that India's SNT community has. And I do hope that the younger generation, Indian scientific generation, science generation, would contribute significantly to the future of humanity and that of our planet. Thank you all so very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mande, for uh, such an informative talk and such an inspiring talk. Because uh, the use of science and technology for societal applications, you have enumerated everything right from the indelible hill to milk powder to wheat and to leather and groundwater recharge and even biofuel for aviation. So, so many things how science and technology has been useful for the society and that would really be inspirational for many of us who are watching and listening to you on this talk. So thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And I request my colleague, uh, Dr. Bhala Murgan to kindly conduct the question and answer session. Dr. Bhala, please. Hello, Dr. Bhala. Okay, it seems Dr. Bala has got disconnected. Uh, Dr. Vineet, are you there? Dr. Vineet? Hey, Professor Deshpande, I'm here. Yeah, please continue with the question and answer session. Okay. okay. Dr. Bala, it seems he's uh, disconnected for some reason. Please. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor uh, Mande, for such a nice talk on uh, covering all the aspects of our development in the field of science and technology after our independence. Okay, so I would like to open the session now for uh, question and answer. So first, I would like to ask our uh, listeners on, on the WebEx platform to ask their questions directly to Professor Mande. And I can see a raised hand. Okay, Professor Bhardwaj, you can ask your question. Thank you, Vineet, and thank you, Professor Mande, for a very informative tech talk to all of us to inform and describe how CSIR Labs has been really contributing to growth of the nation. And I was really intrigued by this biofuel for the jets, you know, which you mentioned. Uh, my query is to know how much of it is actually now being used by our uh, flights or the airlines companies so okay, thank you for that question uh, as of now mangalore refineries mangalore uh, they are actually producing the biofuel uh, there are some challenges and there are difficulties in producing in large quantities that have been recognized all over the world uh, the indian source right now that is being used are a few specialized crops uh, then the challenge is to go and collect the correct residue uh, from wherever, and especially states like Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh, they do that, especially crops like Jatropa. But the future is not really in specialized crops like that. The future would be in the waste agri residues, and the future also would be in waste certain biomaterials, such as I mentioned, uh, the waste cooking oil, for example. So that would be the correct source. And how much this source would be scalable uh, is another thing that needs to be looked at. And the whole world is really looking at that particular aspect right now. But the Mangalore refinery has started in the right earnest. They have started producing the, the, the oil at a very large scale. And we hope that in the coming months, uh, at least routinely, uh, some of the Europeans would start using the biofuel. 
blended biofuel at this moment, not 100%. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Bhalad, would you like to take over the question and, and answer? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I have to re-log in again because everything froze in my computer. Okay, okay, so you can, you can continue. Sure. Sorry about that. Thank you. So we can take more questions. So we have a questions from the panel members and also joined us via the best. So of course, uh, I must mention that it was not a scientific talk, but rather social talk that how science has helped society. So. Bala, you may also look at the YouTube things. Yes, yes. So I'm waiting for the question saying YouTube. Yeah, yeah. There's Professor Pallam Raju is here. He's, he has raised his hand. Yes, we have a question from Professor Pallam Raju. Yes. Uh, yes. So I think my network is not great. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Good. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, and thank you, Professor Mande, for this wonderful and informative talk. You know, you have uh, given several examples of uh, how, uh, how how new, uh, you know, small innovations, but have a profound, uh, you know, uh, impact on various aspects of life. Uh, my, uh, my question was uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the milk powder that you talked about. So uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, is this now still uh, the same uh, process is followed or now uh, some other technology, other advancements have taken place wherein, wherein, uh, uh, you know, um, wherein this is done now? Because earlier you said centrifuge was used because of the higher fat content in buffalo milk. Okay. So the way milk powder is produced now is slightly different. I mean, what you used to call is the roller, you know, the rollers and things like that. It's no more produced using that, but Amul has actually now developed new ways of making milk powder. But fat indeed has to be taken away, take, taken out. And uh, you'd be surprised to know that fat is not wasted. That fat comes on our table as Amul butter that all of us actually use. Yes. You know? so it's not uh, wasted fat in that particular respect. Very often we don't realize uh, these small, small things that uh, we could do. But uh, that, uh, that uh, Technology to produce milk powder in bulk has undergone uh, several revisions, and Amul does in a uh, slightly different way than what was done in those days. Right, and one one more uh, was uh, in terms of the biofuel that you talked about in the last uh, uh, example, and uh, because generally these uh, the, the fuels, you know, especially the ATF that is used in aircrafts and all, you know, is a special kind of fuel which does not freeze at very low temperatures. And uh, so, uh, how do we, uh, how do you, um, you know, ensure that this biofuel, uh, you know, doesn't uh, freeze at that temperature? So, is there something added to that so that uh, uh, the, the freezing point? Hmm. So, sustainable, sustainable aviation fuel is actually made to the specification or the kind of thing that you are actually talking about. And it was tested when it was 20% blended. On the AM32 aircraft that landed in Leh last year. So it has been tested at that particular stage for precisely kind of reasons that what you are talking about. So uh, it's undergoing extensive testing right now, even as the Mango refinery is producing it in bulk at this stage. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Palamaju. We are open for questions. I think there's a question by from Dr. Durga Prasad. Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Bala. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mande. It was uh, really a very wonderful and informative talk. So I have one question. You have mentioned some of these aspects, like in space research and also in defense research, so there are several spin-offs. So there must be some synergy between CSIRs and also this uh, space uh, spin-offs of space as well as uh, defense research. So can you see how synergetically uh, uh, at least a couple of examples, like are there any uh, areas where uh, that synergy has taken place and that has been used for societal benefit? Let me 
you know what I mean? The space and defense, although I did not touch, uh, or if you are aware, it has made such an impact on Indian society simply because we were able to start these programs early on. You know, I mean, in the 1950s and 60s, when we started uh, our space program and the defense research program, that is yet very, very rich. And I don't have to tell you because space program, all of you belong to the Department of Space. So uh, you are aware of the achievements of the space program. In defense, what has happened is that, for example, I will give you an example of Tejas. Right? I mean, Tejas is the light combat aircraft that was meant for the first time designed in India and made in India. The number of components that are go, they go on in making the Tejas, for example, they are carbon composites, which go on making uh, the wings and other aspects of this thing. Now, obviously, neither DRDO nor CSIR would be able to make them. And Tejas was a very healthy collaboration between ADA, uh, that is the, uh, the DRDO uh, Autonomous Society, and HAL, which is a PSU, and NAL, which is a CSIR lab. It's a very healthy collaboration between the three labs together. And different, different labs actually came up with different materials that could be used. For example, there is something called a head up display. In Tejas that allows the pilot to land at a very precise location. The head of display is being made by BEL now. And the spin-offs have come for many, many small components that go into the making of Tejas. So we are actually seeing right now at this stage a great churning period. And space, of course, you are aware. We have seen the other day launch of the private uh, uh, rockets. So it's fantastic actually what has happened. And all of this indeed have synergy between different agencies in the country. It cannot be one single agency that can do it. And what we have seen is multiple agencies have come together and done that. So. Thank you, Dr. Mandi. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Mandi, please unmute your mic and you can ask the question. Yes. Th th thank you, uh, Professor Mandi, for a wonderful talk on the aspects of how uh, uh, life in India has generally improved uh, since independence. Uh, you had mentioned uh, the gross domestic product uh, as a marker, but um, one, uh, uh, as you are aware, there is also another marker which is GDP per capita. Now, there we, you know, we are still uh, lagging far behind, uh, possibly as a result of the population, large population, but. Now, even the population growth rate is under control. So how can science and technology um, and you know, agricultural practices, how can we improve the life of a common Indian, basically, so that uh, we improve the GDP per capita to uh, you know, one of the better economies, uh, you know, a small Western economy in the next 25 years or so? Thank you. This is a very, very relevant question. Indeed, GDP per capita is what we ought to be looking at. But I also mentioned that between 2005 and 2020, we lifted close to about 400 million people out of poverty. You know, I mean, that actually also contributes to GDP per capita eventually. That we don't have four, we have less 400 million people who live in abject poverty. But this number has to go up, right? Now, how do we actually ensure the GDP per capita goes up? And that would happen by providing people with sufficient opportunity to grow and to do what they feel like doing. Right? I mean, especially professional jobs and things like that. Now, if you look at the number of jobs that are available in the market, the government, the different governments, the state government and the central government, the jobs are not that many. You know, in the, to improve the GDP per capita, jobs are not that many. Similarly, the industry, if you look at the large industries, even the large industries don't provide that many jobs. For example, if you take an example of Tata Consultancy Services, which is the largest employer of IT industry in the country, globally, they employ only 5 lakh people. What we are looking at are crores of people that need to be meaningfully employed. And if these people find meaningful employment, the GDP per capita would go up. Right? Now, how do we actually ensure that that happens? And a chunk of our sector which supports itself, which can improve GDP per capita, is in micro and small industries. You know, I mean, if you the small industry and enterprises, they are there, and which is mostly in the informal sector. Now, we must have policies to support this particular sector, and we must have policies to support things like tech-based startups and all, which has the potential of providing a large number of jobs 
and also are becoming uh, have a potential of actually becoming themselves, actually getting some good value, uh, economic value out of their ventures and so on and so forth. The government is continuously working, of course, on all of these together. How to support SMEs, how to support startups, the government is a startup policy, and so on and so forth. But we as society must also ensure that job creation must actually remain one of the topmost priorities for all of us. And if we find actually job creation, if we are able to create large number of jobs in these sectors, and if these people are meaningfully employed and they start earning a good amount of livelihood out of their entrepreneurship or whatever, the GDP per capita would automatically go up. And that should be our focus. And as I said, uh, science technology innovation, of course, will play a very, very major role because a lot of this would be tech dependent. As we, what we see today is uh, what India has done, for example, in the IT space, IT and ITES, is phenomenal. And we see many, many uh, startups and unicorns are actually emerging out of IT and ITES. You know? But there's only one sector, IT and ITES. Similarly, there is a scope, enormous scope in many other sectors. Whether it be agriculture, whether it be biotechnology, whether it be health, whether it be space, there is a scope in contributing to each of these. And that message, if you're able to talk to younger people, that you jump into these kind of things and society will support you, I think that would be a very positive message to the younger generation. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So we wait for other questions. Okay, until we wait, I have one more. I have a question uh, myself. I hope I can uh, go ahead with it. Uh, you you talked about the green revolution and the necessity, and you you can see that the white revolution came up as well. But all these are linked with water. So do you think we need a revolution for water management, given the current condition that we face in the country? Absolutely. I think uh, 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 towards the end of my talk, I talked of water management, and water management actually is getting into a very very critical phase because of our loss of groundwater resources across the country. And uh, there have been traditional practices, as you are aware, if you go to any of the Indian forts, for example, yeah, come to Maharashtra and visit a number of forts, they have a very peculiar way of managing their water resources. And because we are in Gujarat, entire Gujarat and Rajasthan have had traditional practices, you know, these valves and all the wells, they were actually one way of conserving and uh, using water resource judiciously. But science and technology can also help, apart from these traditional practices, as I actually showed you, in mapping groundwater resources and ensuring that wherever groundwater has gone dry, we should actually try to replenish uh, those aquifers and other resources below the surface so that they can be used judicially for the future. So water management, as I said, is extremely critical. We are entering a very critical phase now, and it's time to act now on doing that. Okay, thank you. Uh, in a similar way, what about air management as well? Because the pollution is also another biggest problem, isn't it? Yes, so air pollution actually has multiple components in it. Air pollution actually arises because of a lot of dust, right? I mean, the areas which are dust very close by to uh, uh, some of the deserts and all. Air pollution arises because of the construction activity in a city. Air pollution occurs because of the industrial activity. Air pollution occurs because of the vehicular emissions. Air pollution occurs because of uh, not using gas and use fossil fuel or wood for cooking and so on and so forth. And all of it, we have to have a comprehensive way of having a looking at the air pollution things. And as probably are aware that lung disorders, especially in northern India, are on the rise because of uh, air pollution. And it's a matter of concern. And in fact, uh, it does require a holistic solution in those areas. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, we we'll open for maybe one more question. Yeah. But... Mala, if uh, there is no hand says, I would like to uh, ask one question if time permits. You yeah, please, please see if, uh, yeah. Can I? Please go. Ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mande, I have one question, but that is uh, of the nature of policy or administration. Uh, kind of question and the question is the following that in your talk you have very clearly highlighted that the science and technology can immensely affect the 
quality of life and it can immensely affect the economy of a nation and therefore uh, science and technology both should strive to you know do that kind of research which benefits society and economy now having said there is also a you know as you know group of researchers who who do not really formulate the program to ensure that it benefits the society so so called basic research or fundamental research so what kind of policies or uh, you know scheme do you envisage wherein those who are really doing well in fundamental research they don't get digressed into looking for solutions which will be useful for society yes so what happens is that uh, uh, if you look at the entire spectrum of science, technology, and innovation, uh, there are all aspects to it. There's fundamental research, simply to advance our knowledge. There's one aspect of it. There's translational research, which could convert these discoveries made in the lab into something useful. There's industrial research, which would actually integrate everything into making industrial level manufacturing. And there's of course societal aspect of science and technology in which all the discoveries and industries and all eventually help the common people. All of it actually is part of that one single science and technology spectrum. Now it's very difficult at times to uh, compartmentalize it and say that we will emphasize on one and not the other. We as a country was actually have a complete uh, this thing that we should not really distinguish between who is doing fundamental, who is doing translational, and who is doing industrial work or who is doing societal work. By applications of science and technology. All of it are important in the overall progress of the society, all of this. So there are multiple examples in which fundamental discoveries in very short times have actually yielded some very useful products at an industrial scale. You know, there are many, many examples. I will give one example. There's a work that was being done in the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology on a special variety of rice, which was blight resistant. You know, there's uh, Dr. Ramesh Sondi. He worked on blight resistant rice. And by doing multiple techniques of plant breeding and all, he was able to come up with this. Then he did field trials along with ICR and along with IRR, the Rice Research Institute. And together they showed that this rice was actually very good and it could be implemented in the field. And then it was released to the farmers. Today, about 18 lakh hectares is under cultivation in the country with this particular rice. So what you can see here, is some work done in the lab. He was actually also published some very, very good papers in some of the most visible journals. How are you doing the proper breeding and hybridization and things like that? And so it's a fantastic example of how the discovery made in the lab eventually could benefit farmers and society at large. And there are many examples. I can go on giving many, many examples of how solid publications, translational work, and uh, giving that to public, how actually it is done. In that sense. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, I will pass it on to uh, Dr. Durga Prasad for the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bala, for giving me the pleasant duty uh, to present today's uh, vote of thanks. So, on behalf of the director PRL, PRL Kamrud Vyakyan Kamti, and the entire PRL family, I thank Dr. Shekhar C. Mande for delivering today's 69th Amrit Vyakyan on the topic Addressing Indian Societal Problems Through Science, Technology and Innovation in Post-Independent India, which was a very wonderful, illustrative and informative one. Thank you, sir, for nicely elucidating the growth of India's science and technology since the dawn of independence till date, highlighting the challenges faced and innovations proposed to raise to the current status of self-reliance in science and technology. I thank our director, Professor Anil Bhardwaj, for his constant support and encouragement that helped in keeping this Vyakyan series happening. I thank our Dean, Professor Pallam Raju, Professor Nandita Srivastava, Chair, and Professor Lokesh, Co-Chair, and all other members of PRL Kamrut Vyakyan Committee and others behind for their continued and sustained efforts. Last but not least, I thank all our participants, both on WebEx and YouTube, who have joined today for this Vakyan. With this, we now conclude today's Vakyan and look forward to see you next week with yet another interesting Vakyan. Till then, stay tuned and keep following PRL online platforms for latest updates. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You,